Moby Dick or the Whale by Herman Melville. Chapter 46, Surmises. Though consumed with the hot fire of his purpose, Ahab in all his thoughts and actions ever had in view the ultimate capture of Moby Dick, though he seemed ready to sacrifice all mortal interests to that one passion. Nevertheless, it may have been that he was by nature and long habituation far too wedded to a fiery wellman's ways altogether to abandon the collateral prosecution of the voyage. Or at least if this were otherwise, there were not wanting other motives much more influential with him. It would be refining too much, perhaps, even considering his monomania to hint that his vindictiveness towards the white whale might have possibly extended itself in some degree to all sperm whales. And that the more monsters he slew by so much, the more he multiplied the chances that each subsequently encountered whale would prove to be the hated one he hunted. But if such a hypothesis be indeed exceptionable, there were still additional considerations which, though not so strictly according with the wildness of his ruling passion, yet were by no means incapable of swaying him. To accomplish his object, Ahab must use tools. And of all tools used in the shadow of the moon, men are most apt to get out of order. He knew, for example, that however magnetic his ascendancy in some respects was over Starbuck, yet that ascendancy did not cover the complete spiritual man any more than the mere corporeal superiority involves intellectual mastership. For to the purely spiritual, the intellectual, but stand in a sort of corporeal relation. Starbucks' body and Starbucks' coerced will were Ahab's, so long as Ahab kept his magnet at Starbucks' brain. Still, he knew that for all this, the chief mate in his soul abhorred his captain's quest, and could he, would joyfully disintegrate himself from it or even frustrate it. It might be that a long interval would elapse ere the white whale was seen. During that long interval, Starbuck would ever be apt to fall into open relapses of rebellion against his captain's leadership, unless some ordinary prudential circumstantial influences were brought to bear upon him. Not only that, but the subtle insanity of Ahab respecting Moby Dick was now uh, no ways more significantly manifested than in his superlative sense and shrewdness in foreseeing that for the present, the hunt should in some way be stripped of that strange imaginative impiousness which naturally invested it. That the full terror of the voyage must be kept withdrawn into the obscure background for few men's courage is proof against protracted meditation unrelieved by action that when they stood their long night watches, his officers and men must have some nearer things to think of than Moby Dick. For however eagerly and impetuously the savage crew had hailed the announcement of his quest, yet all sailors of all sorts are more or less capricious and unreliable. They live in the varying outer weather and they inhale its fickleness. And when retained for any object remote and blank in the pursuit, However promissory of life and passion, in the end, it is above all things requisite that temporary interests and employments should intervene and hold them healthily suspended for the final dash. Nor was Ahab unmindful of another thing. In times of strong emotion, mankind disdain all base considerations, but such times are evanescent. The permanent constitutional condition of the manufactured man, thought Ahab, is sordidness. Granting that the white whale fully incites the hearts of this my savage crew and playing around their savageness even breeds a certain generous knight errantism in them still. While for the love of it, they give chase to Moby Dick, they must also have food for their more common daily appetites. For even the high lifted and chivalric crusaders of old times were not content to traverse 2000 miles of land to fight for their holy sepulcher. 
without committing burglaries, picking pockets and gaining other pious perquisites by the way. Had they been strictly held to their one final and romantic object, that final and romantic object too many would have turned from in disgust. I will not strip these men, thought Ahab, of all hopes of cash. I, cash, they may scorn cash now, but let some months go by and no prospective promise of it to them. And then this same quiescent cash all at once mutinying in them, this same cash would soon cashier Ahab. Nor was there wanting still another precautionary motive more related to Ahab personally. Having impulsively, it is probable, and perhaps somewhat prematurely revealed the prime but private purpose of the Pequod's voyage, Ahab was now entirely conscious that in doing so, he had indirectly laid himself open to the unanswerable charge of usurpation. And with perfect impunity, both moral and legal, his crew, if so disposed and to that end competent, could refuse all further obedience to him and even violently wrest from him the command from even the barely hinted imputation of usurpation and the possible consequences of such a suppressed impression gaining ground, Ahab must, of course, have been most anxious to protect himself. That protection could only consist in his own predominating brain and heart and hand, backed by a heedful, closely calculating attention to every minute atmospheric influence which it was possible for his crew to be subjected to. For all these reasons then, and others perhaps too analytic to be verbally developed here, Ahab plainly saw that he must still, in a good degree, continue true to the natural nominal purpose of the Pequod's voyage, observe all customary usages, and not only that, but force himself to evince all his well-known passionate interest in the general pursuit of his profession. Be all this as it may, his voice was now often heard hailing the three mastheads and admonishing them to keep a bright lookout and not omit reporting even a porpoise. This vigilance was not long without reward.